Hello and welcome back. Happy Thursday, everyone. It's been two Thursdays without a happy Thursday, and now we have a happy Thursday, which is the changelog, or not the changelog, uh, the dev diary, rather, for update two in the 1.5 open beta. You can opt into the beta by going into your game in Steam, right-clicking on it, clicking properties, clicking betas, and then selecting 1.5. Uh, this will have all the features, and they have mentioned uh, that all the features should be present. The only thing remaining should be bugs and balance uh, by the time they release this next week. Uh, we will be going Going through it um, you know uh, a lot of this will just be me talking so if you wanted to maybe boot up the game and play and have me in the background this might be a reasonable thing to do uh, but let's jump into it and uh, update 2 will be tentatively launched next week they don't give us a definitive date at this point we should be fully feature complete for the 1.5 release asterisk much asterisk much excite uh, we're close not uh, yet especially with the new naval mechanics but we still have a few more scheduled days and so they have a few days to work on it before they release this doesn't mean everything wrapped up and ready to go we will spend time between this update and the final one fixing bugs doing balance updates and reacting to feedback okay sure uh after this update we will be working towards the final release of uh 1.5 sometime in november i'm guessing it's early november because they have been doing three week sprints so after this next week three week sprints early november uh we get the full release so let's jump into it uh first up we have multiple battles generals uh, are now going to be able to uh advance on their own and try and conquer a state on their own and you'll have multiple battles on front they advance independently of their front lines will repeatedly attack the same state until it's been conquered uh the state the general chooses to attack is dependent on how troops are distributed on the front with higher ranking generals commanding most of the troops uh, troop distribution uh, and general uh, same assignment is an automated affair, so you don't have to worry about it, uh, etc., other than assigning strategic objectives to the states you're most interested in conquering or defending. Uh, does this mean having more generals? Uh, this does mean, and this is probably important for strategy, uh, that having more generals than your opponent on the long front can lead to an advantage, since your opponent won't be able to properly command uh, their defensive troops. Uh, I'm not sure I'm a fan of this, but um, they're not sure either. This should uh, It shouldn't lead to runarounds where the enemy can't properly uh, raise forces at you, uh, against you at all, though. Uh, so I'm guessing they will just be uh, generalist battles, uh, and so all the malices that come with not having a general will be present. We're very curious to know how you feel about this feature which indicates that they're not sure it's good either. We think it should make uh, wars feel better paced, particularly on long fronts, but we want to make sure it feels balanced and fun and no, like, absolutely getting wrecked as a result of having too many generals, not enough generals, faster battles, too many battles, not enough battles, etc. Uh, and so multiple battles, though, uh, will be nice on the super, super long fronts, I think, especially when you start assigning, like, uh, you know, dozens of generals on the battle. It, and I, I'm hoping, you know, that we get to see... Like, when you have a, a revolution in China, for example, and it stretches the entire length of China, the fact that you can only have one battle is insane. And so now if you have, like, a bunch of different generals assigned there, you know, you can, in theory, advance on, like, 15 different states at once, uh, depending on how I'm uh, how this is implemented. And so this is uh, going to be interesting at the very least. Naval battles are back. We will see a return of naval warfare after disabled it in previous iterations of the beta. As mentioned previously, all fleets will now be patrolling specific sea nodes uh, where you can see your forces at any given time. By the way, um, One Proud Bavarian did release uh, a, a sort of video on uh, naval warfare that is a little bit interesting. I haven't watched all of it. I watched some of it. One of the things he talked about is he didn't like that they the navy's dock and hqs rather than specific provinces because you won't be able to like blockade and i thought that was interesting so uh if you were interested in that sort of thing maybe check out his video uh but battles will be fought whenever one admiral has an order that allows them to intercept hostile fleets such as a hostile fleet that is in the same sea node so being able to set you know mind your own business to inter or intercept will be nice when they lose a battle they will go back to their hq their home hq uh and uh they will disable what they are doing so now you will be able to defend against landings uh using navies uh which i think is pretty significant and convoy rating I'm very excited to see how big or how important it is. Note that convoy rating, including the protection of convoys, is unlikely to be functional until the final release. Well, dread. Uh, and as such, there's currently little reason to engage in naval warfare beyond 
protecting your coastlines from invasion. We're still looking into how to deepen the naval warfare experience further and appreciate the input we've received to date. So this is apparently the, the one thing that they are going to be a little bit light on um, in terms of this update. Uh, while we won't be able to fully execute the aspirations we have for naval, naval warfare in 1.5, darn, here's our intent to improve the experience so that it feels like a clear upgrade from the old system while laying groundwork for further improvements. Yeah, the old system had some very significant problems uh, and, you know, uh, just kind of, well, it almost seems like any think would be an improvement especially i'm very happy now you cannot abuse uh multi landings at least to the same degree that you could before you know where you could have five boats in a dream and just landed huge armies uh on great britain with just five boats and um that was obscene uh and now this kind of fixes that and does make navy important um and we'll see how it is with the the, the pms and this type of stuff i'm really excited to see those changes okay conscription it works again uh big nice and uh you know clicking on states in wartime uh, and you just click one button to uh, conscript up. Uh, let's see. Uh, conscription centers for the kinds of conscript battalions you want, uh, which will be nice because you can choose between cannon, uh, horse, and uh, you know infantry. Although I assume there will be some limitations. Um, in the, exactly the same way as your standing army is up to the limit available in each state. So you will be able to customize your army to be really conscript heavy, really conscript light, this type of thing, uh, which I think is fantastic. Uh, like in the past, conscript battalions will not be available in peacetime, but will be raised when you activate them in time of war. However, rather than activating specific states, you'll be activating them for a specific army, which you have in already chosen the conscripts for from the state. So for example, when you make army one, uh, you add like, you decide, hey, I'm gonna add uh, 10 battalions from this province, 10 from this, 10 from this, uh, in, uh, in my conscripts, and the conscripts are just going to be cannon fodder, they're just going to be infantrymen, and something like this. And then the regulars will be the cannons, or, you know, uh, this sort of uh, type of thing, and then, you know, you raise them, and you raise them all at once, it's just one click, it's not 15 million clicks, which is really nice, uh, and, you know, you customize it all beforehand, and then it will be stuck in. Okay. This means when you do mobilize an army, the conscripts will also be lowered, which is really nice as well, which was not kind of the, the, the way it works in 1.4. It's also a single click to raise them, and assuming your army setup is well prepared, it should be a breeze to maintain and balance your conscripted forces. So, a lot of front end, you know, customization with uh, very little back end, you know, utilization on it, uh, I think is the way to go, and it seems to be that's the way they're implementing it. Uh, note that all, not all unit types can be recruited as conscript under all army model laws. Uh, this is going to be important, I assume, uh, in the case of, what is it, uh, the, the rural folk landowners um, army law that they like. It escapes me, the name of it escapes me right now, uh, but it's the one that gives uh, decreased um, cost on uh, army equipment, which is uh, going to be a significant, perhaps, um, bonus, uh, but then you have the malice if you can't make conscript-specific stuff depending on your laws. Okay, uh, we can see here, we do have, at the very least, new pictures for this stuff, and we can see, uh, you know, this looks like the regulars, oop, it looks like we have the regulars right here, and these are the conscripts, and so they have a regular army of line infantry and some conscripted uh, cuirassiers, uh, and I'm not sure exactly what the strategy is going to look like, uh, and it'll be fun to delve into. I hope that these units actually, so in the current iteration of 1.5, that is before this update too, uh, skirmish infantry, mobile artillery, cuirassiers all have the same military stats, so you just recruit all skirmish infantry and it's whatever, um, and, and hopefully, uh, you know, they have a little bit of different things and you're getting different things from them. So, like, maybe these guys give um, front advancement speed, uh, skirmish infantry give defense, mobile artillery are more offensive, or something like this. Uh, I'm not sure, but we'll see. Unit experience and upgrades. Uh, your units will start accumulating experience and gain veteracy levels. Uh, veteracy will, of course, affect offense and defense, but also uh, higher levels can yield other benefits, such as includes morale and morale recovery rate, resulting in, uh, in, uh, in hardier soldiers and fewer lost battles. Getting them to high veteracy levels will take time, of course. Uh, and this is uh, something I really like because it uh, helps to discourage, you know, just spamming a ton of military right before you need it. Um, there were nerfs in, I can't remember if it was 1.3 or 1.4 to how quickly you uh, recruit it up as well, which I think is fantastic. Um, and so, uh, and while getting them into armed conflict will help them gain more experience, casualties will take a counter against them. So this is uh, an important feature, right? 
now you are maybe going to want to have a strategy for having like a reserve elite crack force troops that you very rarely use because you're not going to take casualties although you get more experience in battle i i think that uh new recruits um we'll see exactly how it's balanced i mean it's a function of balance but there might be some strategies required like around you know um having keeping some uh soldiers in reserve for the bigger and more complex battles and this type of thing and trying to make sure that they uh don't lose too many other troops and then having kind of like a speedy force for resolving uh conflicts and the fact that you can mix and match the types of forces you're you're recruiting for various uh tasks is going to be uh, a lot of fun to mess around with Upgrading units will also be possible in an up, uh, open beta update too. Thank God, because before you had to delete all your barracks and then rebuild them. Uh, units of specific types can be toggled for upgrading of, uh, on the formation by formation level, which will result in them upgrading to the default type for their group over time, if they can, that is. Uh, an example of how uh, an example might be in order. Say I have an army with irregular and line infantry, and I just researched a tech that allowed skirmish infantry. Both types are upgradable to skirmish, as we listed in the military uh, formation for the army. I set my new default as skirmish infantry which enables the buttons uh, uh next to each entry in the panel i can choose to toggle one both or neither let's say i choose upgrading my irregular infantry first each week a percentage of my total forces current currently 10 percent subject to balancing and that army will change uh, their type to skirmish infantry in order of experience the more experience going first i assume if they have gained any veteran c levels it will decrease uh eight by one in this process reflecting how outdated militaries uh need time to adapt uh if they are currently immobilized they will demobilize and remobilize reflecting the upgrade time uh required before they become available again now demobilizing and remobilizing takes a long time so you will really not want to do this in the middle of a battle uh in addition to you know uh i assume will be a primary and secondary equipment adjustment uh type of thing uh i can toggle both at the same time if i choose and eventually i'll become skirmish i can toggle one button when the group is halfway done and i know uh, if i notice cost is becoming prohibitive prohibitive and do it later at another point and this the details of this are are perhaps less important but the point is is you can slowly upgrade all your guys to uh the better the better pms uh, and then this will be nice hopefully okay and now we also have this retreat and pursuits uh, uh, section here. These battle conditions have been added to further improve the pacing of warfare. Thank you. Sometimes there's like a war, a battle, you like 100% you know you're winning, and it just stays in for like another month, and it's like, it feels silly. Uh, even beyond multiple battles, these effects come in whenever conditions are met, and don't have to wait for the old conditions to time out. Uh, pursuit. When one side is considerably more men than the other, forces will stop taking morale damage and surround their foe, allowing them to, uh, to use considerably more manpower in each attack. The impact is that they will deal more damage in the same amount of time. The cutoff uh, point for switching to this condition decreases if the enemy is already in retreat. Uh, panicked retreat. When a side has lost a large amount of their starting manpower and their commander is not particularly skilled, they will enter panicked retreat. Uh, this increases their morale loss and reducing recovery rate, uh, leading to losing the battle faster, but with more uh, killed soldiers. Um, so, more killed soldiers. Okay. Uh, notably, for the pursuit, uh, you know, considerably more men than the other does imply to me that, you know, countries like China will get a slight buff from this uh, because you will get to put more manpower into the attack, but okay. And then uh, controlled retreat. If a commander has considerable experience in terms of total value of their traits, particularly skill traits, they may be able to do a controlled retreat. This will lead to very high morale loss, causing the battle to end sooner, but with a slight boost to recovery rate, meaning that you will get fewer casualties and a greater chance of uh, recovery and counterattack, which is also very interesting. And so now, you know, we will see hopefully battles resolve faster. And when you have an overwhelming advantage, uh, you know, something, uh, it'll be useful for this. So this, this is neat. Um, also, rehome formation in here. Very nice. You will be able to have uh, your army have a sort of home HQ that they you can redeploy them to. In addition to stationing a formation at an HQ, you will also be able to change its home HQ. Currently, there are a few distinctions between the HQ you're stationed at and which one you consider home, except for the home one is one you return to. We're looking to add a few distinctions here for the final uh, release in the future. Since home HQ is, uh, is the one your formation is considered to be supplied from, which is important for shipping 
Great Plains mobilization and other aspects. So having, you know, regional armies for putting down regional things is uh, reasonable. Uh, and specifically, I can imagine a, a scenario where if you're colonizing Africa, you probably want an, a uh, an army in Africa just to put down all the native uprisings. And that is like their main function. And you give them PMs accordingly. Like they don't really need a lot of military equipment necessarily, uh, but they're just going to function as an, uh, as an Africa force. Um, so this will be interesting. Here's another interesting one. Food pollution and population growth. They have finally made pollution something that is relevant to the game. Uh, it's been an underlying mechanic that has no effect uh, on anything, uh, but it does get calculated or something to this effect, or it's been like kind of in the game, uh, but not really in the game in the game. Uh, so let's get into it. Grain has generally been in pretty high supply throughout the game and hasn't really provided the important staple good it's meant to be. We have made a number of balance tweaks uh, here to make this stable, make securing a stable supply of grain in particular to take a bit more effort than it used to. Notably, uh, if they do not nerf the rice farms, uh, whatever increase the importance of grain uh, happens, or if there's an increase in the importance of grain, uh, rice farms will get even better, right? Uh, and rice farms are currently out of line with other grain farms in that they have... Um, so before 1.4, they were already the best uh, in terms of PM, uh, but what they did is they doubled the outputs, uh, they doubled the inputs, they doubled the laborers, and all that sounds fine, but they didn't double the construction cost. So you effectively get two buildings for the price of one, and it was already the best building, and so, um, and it only takes up one arable land slot. So in just about every metric, you, uh, it, as far as you're producing grain, you want it to be rice, uh, and it's actually pretty good GDP growth per construction slash investment pool per construction. So as a result of this, you know, them increasing the importance of grain will likely be like functionally a buff to these things. But I digress. Uh, this, of course, ties into population growth, particularly amongst the lower strata. Their biggest demand is grain, and so you raise their SOL by decreasing the price of grain, which seems to be more important in 1.5. SOLs are much stickier, uh, both as a result of mappy overall damaging economies, uh, but also as a result... Uh, well, they not only damage economies, but they also damage uh, your ability to uh, source uh, goods for your pops to consume, because if they're sourcing them from another state, they'll have to pay more, and so this has a depressing effect on SOL. As does, you know, less construction overall. Uh, overall construction was nerfed across the board. Everything costs like 33 to 77% more. And while there are ways to get construction in the form of companies and other things, uh, generally speaking, the economies are slowed down. Okay. Population growth is, as you probably know from our previous uh, Red Dead Diaries, something we've been paying a lot of attention to for 1.5. Generally, they're trying to nerf uh, overall late game pops, which will improve performance, although that's not the only reason they're nerfing it. Uh, and we're still making it tweaks to it. Our intention here is to make population growth from standard living to be something to strive for in the early game, effectively limits uh, your access to labor and ability to... Uh, operate your infernal machines. So currently, the metagame is still really high taxes. You don't care about SOL. You're just caring about adding construction because you are getting more from building uh, buildings than you are, uh, you know, caring about population growth. Um, and eventually you kind of hit a wall where you start running out of labor and construction becomes less important and then decreasing taxes maybe makes sense. But currently this is less of a thing and you mainly get it through migration and conquest. Uh, or get it by it, I mean enough laborers. Okay, uh, but if they make SOL an important enough metric, then here we go. While limiting overpopulation problems in the late game. In addition to rebalancing tweaks, which we will continue to make, we have previously talked about uh, additional factors we have added, such as negative impact on birth rate from unemployment. I really like this one. Uh, the negative impact on birth rate from unemployment, it makes you really care about uh, unemployment as a modifier and actively, like, actively seeking it out. I wish the UI was a little bit better for identifying where you have unemployment specifically, because right now it just shows available labor. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, uh, if one the way I'm doing it, or the way I do it currently right now, is I look at the population or the migration attraction, and then from the migration attraction, uh, you know, uh, if you see a place that's super red, almost always uh, what will be going on in it is going to be massive unemployment is generally what causes really, really red effects uh, in terms of migration. And so when you see that, you just build a lot of jobs there, and this will increase your, uh, you know, pop growth. Okay, increases the sizes of urban centers as you progress through the tree. This also uh, kind of helps out a little bit. We are now adding gameplay effects uh, to a feature that has been in the game for a long time, but only as a visual, uh, but only as a visual feature, pollution. Okay, uh, 
Pollution is generated by your building's production methods to various degrees. Higher tech production methods often increase uh, pollution, but not always. For example, like electric railways are going to have less than steam engines, uh, but generally speaking, uh, you are going to be moving up in pollution. You can see this generated pollution uh, sort of modifier here. Uh, and it is tied to the various PMs inside the iron mines. Pollution is uh, generated, uh, is moder moderated by the state's arable land. Uh, and this just says arable land, not available arable land. So it does seem to be the case then that, uh, you know, industrializing in uh, places with a ton of arable land is going to be better because you won't suffer this effect uh, from this pollution mechanics. Uh, and so this, I see this as like a Qing buff, uh, effectively speaking. So one province states with huge industries will be much more polluted than the vast countryside where the industrial industry can be more spread out. Uh, pollution can have an uh, impact on populations, inclu uh, including increasing mortality and decreasing the standard of living, but can also have an impact on the state itself, such as migration attraction. Um, so we are increased mortality and decreased standard of living uh, versus migration attraction. And so here we see pollution impact. It says 51% uh, arable land, uh, or let's see, generated pollution, 7,900, arable land, 45, uh, and trending towards 40, 51. And this is giving minus standard of living, minus uh, migration attraction, 25 increased mortality seems like a lot. Uh, and so this will overall in the super late game uh, depress uh, things, but you can do stuff about pollution. Uh, it seems to be uh, that health systems will positively affect it. Let's kind of take a look uh, more. Here we can see an entire breakdown on what's producing pollution here in Lancashire. Uh, uh, population is then scaled by technologies as well as healthcare institutions so you can manage some of your pollution in your incorporated territories by investing heavily into healthcare. There we go. Of course, you can always outsource your most polluting industrial states or sorry, polluting industries to states on the margins of your empire. You don't want to do this if you're on colonial exploitation and derive benefits from um, them for your pleasant core states. But if these states are uh, unincorporated, they will bear the full brunt of uh, pollution your industries produce. The, by this, they mean, of course, that your healthcare institutions only apply in your incorporated territories. And so, um, you know, you will be, you can only get the benefit of uh, the, uh, what is it, pollution reducing effects if you are in, in incorporated states. And here we see uh, pollution effects reduction, uh, minus 10% from modern sewage and minus 10% from charity health hospitals level two, which implies you will be getting minus 25% uh, from, you know, max level uh, healthcare system. And then also this makes modern sewage even better. Modern sewage was already getting better, but the adding of pollution effects um, seems to make, really make it a lot better. So this has also resulted in a bit of rebalancing of the effects of different healthcare laws. Private health insurance and charity hospitals provide a bit less pollution effect reduction than public uh, health insurance does, but with different impacts on individual pops depending on their wealth. Okay, so we actually see a whole entire rebalancing of this bracket, which will be interesting. Um, you know, in here we see, oh, minus 40% pollution effects on reduction and mortality per wells. So it does seem, I guess, as you scale into the hyper late game, what is this? So this is going to be capped at 25, and this is going to be capped at 50 for the private health insurance. Uh, interesting, and uh, it'll be interesting to see that public, uh, so I guess public health insurance is going to provide the most pollution reducing effects. So maybe this is going to be a, a buff to public health insurance. Uh, there is a new sexy map mode, of course, uh, they even say so, uh, for uh, migration, of course, or sorry, migration pollution. Of course, there's a ton in perm, uh, as it were. Uh, here we have, you know, pollution impact, 49% trending towards minus standard of living, migration attraction, mortality. Uh, as the game mechanic, the intent of pollution is to provide an additional reduction to pop growth in the mid to late game when overpopulation is more likely to occur due to increased standard of living. However, since pollution is a factor with quite a bit of player control and control in both directions, it is also a lever uh, uh, of your society with trade-offs that can pull you in either direction depending on your conditions. There will probably be a meta best. I'm not sure if it'll be to care or not care. I'm guessing it's going to be to not care too much, but we'll see. Okay. Local prices and companies. UIs uh, and tooltips related to local prices have received a facelift, thank God, uh, to assist with the readability and understanding. The AI is now able to handle uh, centralizing and versus decentralizing of different uh, of industrial sectors to account for local price 
distinctions between states so the AI should be a lot better. Special companies are no longer limited to specific countries, but have the unique conditions to establish them instead, such as cultures. I don't know exactly what this means because not a most it seems like they were already limited to cultures rather than to countries and so i'm not ex i'm not sure what this means like uh you needed primary culture japanese uh versus pr uh, and so maybe it's just the case that you need to have a certain level of pop of these cultures or something like this we have also added more unique il illustrations for companies it's uh replacing placeholders nice and improve the ui around them considerably but they do they haven't mentioned like rebalancing but this is uh one i really like is you will now be able to uh put in the outliner uh whether or not you're getting the bonus from these, which is very important for companies like the Generic Steel Company, which give you 10% construction across the board and um, are very strong, but only if you're getting their, their bonus. Okay. <sighs> Time to take a look at narrative, uh, narrative content. So uh, this guy is uh, flipping it over and over to a different dev, which of course, Dev Diaries. A uh, different dev will be talking about uh, some of the new free content that's gonna be added in 1.5. Uh, isn't it all free? Uh, anyways, uh, so this is narrative content. Colonial administrations. The 1.5, uh, the free 1.5 update expands the scramble for Africa with new specialized colonial administrations that may be formed in several Africa regions. Using these colonial, uh, administrations as a journal entry, unlocked with the scramble of Africa, uh, and colonizing powers may assign their African colonies to a new subject state. So here we have, uh, we can establish Niger, uh, Senegal, and this sort of thing. Um, and so we can only establish one every three months. Uh, uh, you get nature of the administration uh, while establishing a local colonial administration we will be able to tailor its laws and governments to best suit the needs of the metropole uh, uh, and its constituent uh, interest groups um, so this is the thing any French uh, lands uh, within the relevant strategic legion will be transferred to our new colonial subject if a state has the greener grass campaigns a random state with that decree will be designated as its capital if a state has a greener grass campaign degree, a random state with that decree will be designated as the capital. So you can control the capital by having greener grass uh, laid down uh, as you want. Now, uh, I don't know why you would want to give up land other than RP considerations unless they give you uh, some sort of bonus or, or um, you know, uh, leveraging or having certain interest groups you want in particular powerful to try and get bonuses might make sense. Like, uh, you know, if you if you want them to mainly be rural and you release them with like a powerful rural folk or something like this, uh, it's so that they can get the 10 to 20% throughput bonus, I guess. Uh, but they're not gonna be able to build as efficiently as you. So I think this is mainly just flavor, uh, unless, uh, you know, we can see something uh, something special. Um, the Here we have an event for picking the nature of the administration. We can't see what all these will do, but we say it will be administered by a chartered ha East Houseland company. I'm guessing uh, this is will make it commercial agriculture. The Protestant missions will uplift the local populace, uh, state religion, I guess. In the darkest Africa, a new Great Britain will emerge, maybe just the same laws as you. The whip will crack and the colony will provide. Uh, and so maybe, uh, you know, having a slave colonial thing like makes sense. I haven't really thought of the strategy, but it is interesting. These administrations make the use of the new dynamic tax feature, which allows the creation of new, extremely configurable nations in script, rather than relying on existing tags for your mods, uh, warlord, uh, period, or seven-sided uh, civil war. Uh, they create dynamic country function, allows for rapid defining of several new nations at once, uh, configurable whenever laws, cultures, or religions, or names you want to assign to them. So this is interesting, but modding relating, and so beyond my purview. Uh, the, uh, the results of some of the colonial administrations you can see below, uh, with Belgium ha uh, handling the control of the Congo off to the colonial administration, and f uh, France splitting its territories into West Africa in Twain between Guinea and Outer Houseland administration. So here you can see Guinea, Outer Houseland, col uh, colonial or Congo Oriental, and we see a somewhat reasonable looking Africa here which is part of uh, kind of uh, a feature we'll talk about in a little bit. But again, I, I can't, uh, also Slovenia must be a multiplayer game. I, I'm not sure exactly what the, um, what, how should I say, what the incentives for uh, from a player perspective are at this point in time uh, for giving up control of your land to a subject. 
Uh, the names and requirements for these colonial administrations are currently a work in progress. Once we have the final, uh, the finished product, each colonial administration will possess dynamic names derived from their overlord, for example, etc. Uh, you know what is maybe you think you can have different companies than your overlord, and so but the AI is so bad. But if you expand out all the resource industries in a particular place, then maybe swapping it over to the AI to give them and let them use companies that work better with uh, kind of what you're doing might make sense. I'm not sure. We'll see. Um, and this is the feature we're talking about here, colonial trading. Uh, as any player knows, the nice borders do not typically emerge. Yeah, <laughs> you're telling me. For example, when does this happen? Look at this, so nice, big nice. Uh, however, uh, so what you can do is uh, you can now trade states. There's a solution with, uh, while, stri grump while the scramble is for Africa is ongoing, the AI will use the trade states uh, function to smooth out colonial borders, resolving claims in an attempt to minimize the number of split states in Africa. Fantastic. This will look really nice. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure you as the player will never be able to abuse this uh, to give yourself uh, access and ingress into stuff like Kenya uh, in exchange for, you know, relatively worthless territory. I'm sure that will not happen. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, so... But we, we can clean up borders at the very least. Uh, as can seen above, Mozambique is now sl slightly closer to being whole. So we see here versus here. Okay. Uh, with Portugal continuing to offer concessions to fix its borders. Alternatively, Britain, play, uh, Britain could grant them more colonies out of the goodness of their hearts or in the future an obligation. So not currently implemented, but... Uh, Offering an obligation for colonial territory seems like a nice kind of future. Newly acquired uh, states may be transferred to colonial administrations by button, who ensuring that Africa will not turn into a pocket market of mess of ide <laughs> identically colored tags. Uh, we have new formables and unifications. Uh, ever since we released Victoria 3 1.0, a common request has been for additional formables. Uh, update uh, 1.5 uh, aims to add national flavor for unification, including events uh, fired by unified countries. Uh, formable nations can be voted on by the players, etc. The new formables we have included is the result of a community poll, of which you guys didn't vote for Carthage. Shame on you. Uh, Includes Benelux, the Confederation of the Rhine, or uh, the Holy Roman Empire, and Rio de la Plata. Rio de la Plata looks a lot like just our big Argentina to me. Um, so there we have it. It's big Argentina. Uh, obviously uh, incorporating, you know, the, what is it, Paraguay and uh, Uruguay or whatever. Um, here we have uh, Benelux, which is just Netherlands. Um, for those of you who play <laughs> EU4, that's just Netherlands, my guys. Um, no, it's it's obviously Belgium uh, con uh, formed together with ne uh, the Netherlands, creates Benelux. Uh, and then here we have the North Rhine or whatever, what was it called? Uh, the Confederation of the Rhine, and then also the Holy Roman Empire. Okay, uh, there's uh, stuff for Italy and Krakow and uh, Poland and this type of thing. Uh, the journal entry for Italian states has been entirely reworked based on your feedback, uh, with an arsenal of new tools that can be used to stir national descent across Italian regions into the formation of in, uh, Italy. Uh, and so here you see you can spur pro unification sentiment, encourage Italian nationalism, this type of thing. Uh, and you see nationalism spreading through Europe, Sardinia Piedmont, uh, reaching 25% will lead to the seizure of the Piedmont government by pan-Italian revolutionaries and the installment of a democratic republic. Uh, and so, okay, um, we will, uh, I guess, uh, pro-unification, I guess this is democratic, this is non-democratic, but apparently there's more local flavor here for Italy. Uh, prospective Italian unifiers may encourage Italian nationalist sentiment of, uh, in the Italian regions of Austria, leading to bigger secession and reenactment of the first war of Italian independence. Fantastic. Or make use of pro-unification sentiment on the peninsula to overthrow a reactionary government at the hands of the pan-Italian movement. Cool. Uh, in addition to buttons provided by this uh, new stir uh, national agitation, uh, character interaction for agitators allows agitators who are friendly to the current form of government to induce radicalism in states of your national culture, which is interesting, uh, which they uh, which are under control of another nation. This action is available for all, all nations once nationalism technology is unlocked. Uh, perfect for revanchist nations that wish to reclaim territories of their neighbors. So Romania and Poland come to mind. But here we have 
Poland, as well, has been given uh, content oriented towards unification with the new Christ of Nations journal entry under Krakow, and other Polish states may join if they come into existence over the course of the game, uh, and you can foster Polish radicals abroad uh, through this journal entries button, as well as stir uh, national agitator interaction. Krakow can both radicalize Polish props ab abroad, stirring secessions which then support their wars for their independence, and unify with their uh, victor upon their victories. And so, uh, once it's broken free, it will kind of uh, merge with Krakow, is the idea. And once the territories of Poland will be reclaimed, the nation will be able to choose between two conceptions of the Polish nation. The Piast version, hopefully I pronounced that right, and then Jagalonian version, I'm not sure about the pronunciation there, for a smaller homogenous Poland or a larger thick Poland spreading across all of Eastern Europe. Um, you know, this is the option. If after reclaiming their homelands, Poland seeks to form the Poland-Lithuania Commonwealth, a new journal entry will appear, granting Poland-Lithuania as the option to expand further in the east and reclaim its historical borders. Uh, here we stay establish the Commonwealth. Uh, we see some stuff for loyalists and this type of thing, and we see it's going to occupy quite a lot of states. Uh, if ambitious, uh, if ambitions can be successfully uh, realized and its lands reintegrate, the Commonwealth's uh, status of global power is nearly assured. That's a lot of territories, a lot of really good lands in there too. Uh, if you're thinking, you know, uh, from a value perspective, it does look like they have Silesia, uh, which is one of the best states in the game, and they have some of the, the wood, uh, the lumber bonus, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Russian land, um, or I guess properly not Russian land, uh, Lithuanian land. And then down here we have uh, states like Kiev. I guess Luhansk is not in here. Um, I think Kiev is in there and then Luhansk is not. I'm not sure. Uh, geography. But um, yeah. Here we see other unifications. Uh, formable nations from uh, Indonesia to Yemen have been given unique formation events. These events do appear on national unification, granting nations the additional prestige, claims on homeland territories they do not yet own, or other bonuses unique to that nation. So this will be nice. Uh, for modifiers, these events are enabled by a new on-country form nation, which allows triggering events immediately after a nation forms. Uh, but what if a public attempts to form the HRE? We do see United States of Europe. Yikes. Um, that's a big, that's a big thing. Uh, so, okay. Now we have some interest group tweaks. Uh, the base politics of Victoria 3 is the pops, you tell me, and we uh, striving to make politics ever more interesting and varied, both in terms of flavor and also in the nature of your politics. Uh, interest group makeup, uh, the patch 1.5 creates a battery of changes to your interest group makeup designed to make uh, the political structure of a nation more dependent on its laws with pops aligning towards different interest groups depending on the social structure that the player has crafted for the nation. Now, this sounds like a bunch of words, and there's a good reason for that. It is a bunch of words. But what it will mean is that your laws are going to change the base attraction of interest groups, which mean you're going to be able to shape what your countries will look like in terms of interest group clout uh, in a much better way uh, on the basis of laws rather than just some sort of like uh, just economic type of thing where as the SOL goes up, trade unions get stronger is the general effect. Um, you know, you kind of experience a game. Now, now there will be different attraction that is contingent on laws. The goal of these changes to make interest groups more dynamic over the course of the game with certain laws able to expand the uh, power of interest groups in society way more than organic than a flat uh, bonus to the interest group clout. For example, in 1.5, there have been a change to the homesteading law. Uh, instead of benefiting the rural folk directly, the law now benefits the clout, uh, the political strength of small farmers who own the majority of the land in the United States, but this is not the only change. Looking at closer groups of the Pops themselves, we can see that Ohioan farmers are beginning to gravitate towards a new interest group, and that is the Petit Bourgeoisie. Uh, under homesteading, farmers are more likely to claim the free land on the frontier themselves and hire farm hands, thus making them a member of the Petit Bourgeoisie class. This, however, is not uniform across the country, whereas in the North, the yeoman and farm members predominate. Uh, there are enough middle farmers to form a sizable uh, rural petite bourgeoisie. The southern slave states have an altogether different dynamic. In the south, the presence of slavery stratifies the farmers into, ext into either extremely wealthy or extremely poor, sharpening their attraction to the landowners and weakening their attraction to the petite bourgeoisie. So here we see, uh, you know, 
uh, primary is rural folk, and we see 63% with 14% attraction there. But here with the planters, we see much more attraction uh, towards this. And this is on the basis of, uh, you know, uh, the profitability as a result of the slavery, you know, being less up top versus more uh, middling. And so if there's more middling, we will have increased attraction of the petite bourgeoisie. It'll be interesting to kind of unpack all these effects uh, as they relate to different laws, because this is just a single example. But hopefully we have a robust change log, because these types of effects are a little bit hard to discern just through playing, because there's so much confounding variables, and so it's always good to know um, what exactly is doing what. Uh, the result of this is that nations with homesteading will gain a much stronger petite bourgeoisie class. Yes, because their ownership class of those places is more, uh, it's less stratified and it's more level, which will give more petite bourgeoisie attraction. As the farmers who are too wealthy for the rural folk and too poor for the landowners find their niche, niche in the middle class, the effect of this law can be seen in the petite bourgeoisie window. Um, here we see uh the attraction of the petite bourgeoisie uh they have to not be aristocrats so farmers are eligible not capitalists uh, they have to belong to the primary culture or one of the primary cultures and they have to be employed in etc mostly etc and then all or uh one of having homesteading or commercialized agriculture so that's not tenant farming and they are employed in one of these things and they're middle strata so this will mean you know, if you are leaning into the petite bourgeoisie, you almost certainly want to get onto homesteading or commercialized agriculture, but they do not have, uh, you know, the owner does not appear to be the one of the council republic one, which will, I guess, support the laborers. And so um, this means leveraging petite bourgeoisie uh, will be a bit more of a choice uh, in regards to like what you're doing here. And this is, cr ad this is adding texture to the game and choices. Okay. Away from the fields and the universities, intelligentsia interest group has been made much more exclusive, representing a narrower band of class identities. Okay, very. let's take a look. Uh, rather than being a simple catch-all for all highly literate pops, the intelligentsia is now more group-specific of bureaucrats and upper-class and middle-class intellectuals. Rather than just having the ability to read, you have you must now have time and money. So it used to be you would just, as your pops got more literate, they would be attracted to the intelligentsia, and you would actually get a ton of capitalists uh, being intelligentsia, and that's actually where a lot of your uh, intelligentsia clout would come from. Um, here we go. To compensate for removing the ability of poor people to have, take part in the intelligentsia, pops in certain buildings will now gravitate towards the intelligentsia at a much higher frequency. And so we will see uh, overall general pop decrease, but now I'm guessing it's going to be primarily, you know, uh, bureaucrats and uh, academics will be much more strongly attracted here. Uh, the distinguished gentlemen uh, in the public service of St. Petersburg are much like, more likely to gravitate towards the intelligentsia due to their status as public administrators in the urban government uh, uh, administration. So this, again, will give you a little bit more power um, to affect things, uh, but here we see uh, these guys will be attracted to the intelligentsia at a decent rate, the government administration. Why is the government administration? Has it always been led by aristocrats? Woo. All right. Uh, fair enough. Uh, in addition to their workplaces, laws have always been uh, in the inclinations of the aristocracy to support the intellectual class. Hereditary bureaucrats may have its downsides, but it's paired with a bonus towards aristocrats' uh, attraction towards the intelligentsia, providing developing nations a much-needed boost towards the modernization in the early... Oh, this is on... Okay, this is on, yep, yep, that makes sense. Uh, this is the bureau, the government administration uh, when it's on the, the one that you don't want to be on very often, hereditary bureaucrats. But getting more attraction towards the intelligentsia is probably not as good as appointed bureaucrats, uh, but boosting the, this, uh, the intelligentsia in the early game is going to have a rather nice effect there. So, um, okay. It'll be more level throughout the game. As opposed to the current situation where increasing pop literacy tends to make the intelligentsia strength unintentionally grow out of control in the late game, 1.5 changes are oriented towards making it smaller, more elite group throughout the game. So a little bit more powerful at the start and weaker at the end. Progressive but limited mass power can truly wield. This will also probably make it hard to get a doubled bonus on them uh, based on what they're sh saying the changes are. Rather than always being enormously uh, more relevant for the, uh, the than the equality for equally middle class uh, petite bourgeoisie, the intelligentsia will now compete for middle class with them. This also seems to imply that uh, the, uh, in addition to changes they're going to add, the devout interest group will be much uh, much easier to keep, um, you know, powerful throughout the game. 
and here we have it. Another problem has been the death of the devout in the late game. Uh, with the additions to the interest group attraction, religiously oriented laws will not uh, will not only increase the cloud of the devout, but will also increase the willingness of certain pops to join the devout uh, rather than any other interest group. This is really important because currently in the game, there, uh, as you get later and later, uh, you know the overall attraction to the devout doesn't look that good and it's like hard to get uh, really into it and it's really hard to lean into the church especially if you want to um you know use something other than religious schools um i think either religious schools or charity hospitals has a cap that the other one uh that uh the or it might even be both i can't remember um that you know the the non-religious uh laws have and so this is a bit of a hindrance as well and it makes you know you'd, you'd kind of rather do the other ones while still trying to make the devout you know powerful and but if you go all state religion and stuff you could probably still get them above 20 percent clout according to this uh and this is going to be a good thing if you want to lean into them and a bad thing for those who start on state religion and you don't want it looking at you russia um so because russia's uh clergy or their orthodox church uh opposes a change from autocracy but anyways, uh, through, uh, through going all in on laws like state religion and religious schools, any non-atheist pop's chance of joining the devout can be greatly increased, making these laws present a real double-edged sword. Instituting the reforms of uh, the devout uh, support will increase literacy, yes, but they will also increase the strength of the church far more than previously. Okay. A variety of laws have been changed to accommodate shifts in uh, interest group attraction and availability. For example, peasant levies will now make aristocrats gravitate more towards armed forces. This is maybe a good thing um, because, or like, them gravitating towards armed forces uh, means that, you know, while peasant levies does give the more clout to traditionally the landowners, if they gravitate more towards the, uh, the armed forces, the aristocrats, then maybe, you know, this is uh, something you could consciously choose. Now, we have to take a closer look at peasant levies as far as it, uh, it affects mobilization options and other things, um, which I'm curious to see, uh, because it does give reduced uh, uh, military goods cost, and this has always been uh, a modifier that I have been interested in, or I have been interested in for, like, maybe two months now. Uh, because it's a free money modifier, but that's a bit of a digression. Uh, commercialized and collectivized agriculture will now make farm laborers uh, to, able to join the trade unions. So previously, you could not get trade unionists in these sorts of things. Um, commercialized and collectivized agriculture. So commercialized agriculture might be really good on the grounds of like how it's affecting clout because it can also positively affect the petite bourgeoisie as we read earlier colonial resettlement makes the non-discriminate settler population in, in unincorporated states more militaristic let's uh that's a lot of words so let's reread it uh colonial resettlement makes the non-discriminated settler population in an uncorporated in an un in in unincorporated states more militaristic uh, and professional army decreases the attraction of non-military pops to the armed forces but increases the attraction of military pops this is like this is all so interesting that this there's going to be so many effects and it's not just like this purely economic access but instead it's going to change a whole bunch of things i hope that this is in tooltips and it doesn't like require us like digging through a bunch of absolutely psychotic stuff okay Interest group traits. In addition to making the makeups of interest groups more dynamic, Patch 1.5 also adds new interest group traits to various interest groups across the world, uh, representing a unique historical character of different countries. Now, uh, the old lady of Threadneedle Street and Civil Service, or the old lady of the the streets and the, the sheets, um, this is already in game, as far as I can tell, so this is a little bit of a late kind of update, and we've already re read or gone through this in, like, various other pieces of content, um, you know, where the, the armed forces of Qing is unique, uh, the industrialists of Japan is unique, uh, probably worse, the petite bourgeoisie of the UK is probably overtuned, uh, the Sunni Ulema is interesting because it gives more conversion, the armed forces gives the interesting modifier we're talking about, which is minus military goods cost, um, and so, uh, just kind of interesting to note these things but we've talked about them quite a bit anyways um and so here we also have some visual stuff even though the updates the narrative content is not quite all the arts team has all been super busy making both 2d illustrations as well as 3d models and animations while not all visible in game yet many of them are and so uh we will be seeing those uh both here and also on final release so we see a bunch of uh different uh culture specific uh it looks like um you know institutions of military uh peasant levies to whatever um these are i'm assuming the canons and these are the curiousers or the 
cavalry, I'm assuming cavalry will include tanks. That'll be a part of the cavalry. So these four are the cavalry units. These four are the line or, or military or infantry. These four are the cannons. And then we have, you know, line, uh, I guess it's all cavalry. Turtles all the way down. It's just all cavalry. Always has been. And then here we see a lot more cannons. Uh, and then we have, uh, you know, just the two tanks. No cavalrymen and some of this. Uh, it looks like we do see it quite a bit more down here too. I like boats, aka trains of the sea. Get me those trains in chat. Uh, and then here we have uh, dynamic fainting. And my personal favorite, dramatic fainting cannons. Dramatic fainting dramatic fainting cannons aww they couldn't bear the shame and the humiliation of missing the shot okay fire in the hole we do see some cannons firing this is going to be pretty pretty nice to to see uh firearms maintenance someone's gun is jamming maybe it looks like they're loading a musket a little bit of a size discrepancy that guy is way too big for that choo-choo but fair enough uh long range rifles are cool and all but the guy in the center really needs to be more careful yeah he's just uh you know, uh, you're not supposed to bust out the dance moves on a live firing area. And then here we see a little bit of a battle thing. Okay. Finally, uh, there is a bit on performance. Last but not least, certainly not least, we are continuing to work on performance, especially in the mid to late game performance. In addition to some of the lower level Im improvements of etc. and mostly etc., uh, we have some changes here. Job satisfaction. Uh, populations now have a job satisfaction uh, parameter visible in the UI and computed uh, based on factors such as wage compared to the normal wage or the average wage for their profession in the country and the state, how many qualifications they have for higher paying jobs, whether they're unemployed and so on, etc. Mostly, etc. If their job satisfaction is high enough, they won't bother looking for other jobs. This helps performance by letting us exclude these pops as prospective candidates when we evaluate employment uh, pro or process migration and also helps uh, improve UX by giving us more precise numbers of pops that are job seekers in a particular state i really hope that they bifurcate peasants and unemployed because uh there is a very substantive difference between the two uh in terms of like how you prioritize dealing with them and i would love to be able to sort through um which ones are unemployed and which ones are peasants and like the outliner thing and they, and they indicate different pieces of information. Like, if you have equilibrium unemployment in the state and also simultaneously have unemployed, uh, you know, this is a different indicator to you than if you have, uh, you know, equ uh, if you have equilibrium un unemployment and also have peasants. Um, like, the, the, anyways, that's a digression. Okay. Migration and cultural communities. I don't know how I feel about this one. The performance impact of migration is not in actually making sure it happens, but in the large amount of pop fragmentation it can create. This is why I think they've continually nerfed my, uh, multiculturalism more than anything, more than uh, a reason actually tied to game mechanics uh, or like simulation. I think it's because they don't want to cause the splintering as early in the game. This is because in the past, each pop is considered where it can move to and then split itself into multiple smaller fragments and move to all of those variable places in numbers depending on the relative migration attraction between the source and the target. We have now changed this such that Pops will only consider to moving a state that already has a cultural community of the same type. And so, will this make it so you can't actually pull Han migrants uh, from your customs union or something like this? Will this just be a huge nerf to migration? Okay, we'll see. Over several weeks, they will build up a small migration wave, and when they finally move, many Pops move all at once to that specific state. So, um, perhaps it's just going to be, uh, you know... Uh, a bunch will move to one state uh, and then they will just keep flooding that state and then you will be like, this is the state that gets the Han Chinese migrants. Um, okay. Uh, in this way, cultural communities work similar to mass migration targets and indeed the latter act as the former, but there are far more cultural communities than mass migration targets. The presence of any pop in the state automatically creates a cultural community there to match the culture. If there are no pops of the right culture, there's still a chance that one might be created if the migration attraction of the state is high enough. So it might be the case that now you really care about increasing the migration attraction enough to create a cultural community in the first place in order to actually get subsequent migrants. This chance is scriptable for the models uh, monitors out there and can support any number of different parameters such as laws, available jobs, etc. Um, once the wave has arrived, uh, of course, this will impact the migration attractiveness of the state. The newly arrived migrants will tend to have lower SOL when they arrive, but they take on jobs that will affect both their own finances and those of other pops in the state over time. 
Subse subsequent migration waves are therefore likely to target another prosperous state next time, and so on. The intent here to, is to make uh, intra-market uh, intra uh, migration feel more tangible and meaningful. I don't know how it's going to make it feel more meaningful if you're overall nerfing it. With less of the trickle of every kind of pop moving between the state and the market, I guess the intention uh, is to have the migration be larger in larger chunks. This also naturally leads to less pop fragmentation, because if they're deciding to leave and go to one of your states, but only one of your states, then they're not going to all of your states all simultaneously. By the late game, job satisfaction also plays into this by ensuring only dissatisfied pops care about moving elsewhere, which cuts down on the computation needed. It bears mentioning that by the time update 2 launches, this feature will be probably be pretty unbalanced. Yeah. Migration waves might be too strong or not enough. Yep. Yeah. Uh, cultural communities might spawn too easily or in sufficient numbers. Yep. Yeah. The cutoff points for, for when someone chooses how to move or how rapidly uh, build up a migration wave might be wrong, etc. We're, we're hoping for a ton of feedback on this, and we'll get tuned on the numbers. Um, yep. And then finally, uh, as a little bit of an outro, uh, change log or the lack thereof. Fortunately, we have not been able to produce a full change log for you, the Stev Diary, but there should be one forthcoming alongside the update beta 2 release, so we can expect that in a few days. As mentioned, uh, we hope to get update 2 uh, out sometime next week. That is a hope, not a guarantee. Uh, please be sure to keep an ear out on the Discord for the announcement and provide your feedback as you play. This Dev Diary marks the end of the three-week Dev Diary update schedule, and you'll be hearing it from us again in two weeks, and once per week after that for a while. So we're going to have it in two weeks. I thought it was a three-week sprint. Hmm. Okay. I guess they're changing the schedule up. I thought it was going to be another three weeks. I guess they'll be here. We'll be hearing from them in two weeks. Uh, probably. I guess maybe they want to do two dev diaries in a row before the release or something like that as part of their three week sprint. Or maybe they've changed it to a two week sprint because they're pretty satisfied with where one point five is at right now. Uh, we will see. But uh, we will be concluding this rundown. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, to hit the notification bell, etc. Mostly, etc. Uh, if you've been sitting for a while, maybe get up, take a stretch, go on a walk do some push-ups some squats and other than all that have a good day